you have your Bibles this morning, you're going to need two passages of Scripture. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30. I'm going to read those three passages of Scripture out of the New King James Version. And then also go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read those verses out of the New King James Version as well. Now, I know some of you have already noticed that I've got two passages of Scripture this morning, and now you understand why you were a few minutes late getting into the third experience, because I do my best to work with one passage. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be a long sermon today. He's got two passages. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. This morning, Acts chapter 20 and 1 Peter chapter 5, I want you to know are coming from two of the greatest shepherds the first church ever knew. When I say the first church, I mean the church in the first century of the first hundred years. Acts 20 is coming to us by way of the Apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 5 is coming to us by Peter by way of the Holy Spirit. So what we're about to look at on this topic of shepherds is some very powerful insight from two of the greatest shepherds in the New Testament, Paul and Peter. Amen? I think we should pay real careful attention. Here's what the Apostle Paul had to say. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. Do you hear that, preachers? Watch your own life first. And then also watch over the flock. Every preacher has two responsibilities. Watch how he lives first and then watch how his flock lives second. Let me go on a little bit further. Therefore, take heed to yourselves, overseers, shepherds, and preachers, and then to all of the flock. Look at this. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Notice that the shepherds, have a divine appointment from a divine authority by the person of the Holy Spirit that's put them in this place of shepherding. Let me go on a little bit further. You're shepherding over the church of God, which Jesus purchased, not with gold, not with silver, not with American greenbacks and hundos, Benjamin Franklin's. He purchased with his very own blood. Woo! This was a prized possession that he's given shepherds the responsibility of overseeing. But it comes with an instruction of watching your own lives first before you watch over the flock. Look what Paul said. Paul said, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among the flock, not sparing the flock. Now, a lot of people today like to hear positive things. They like to hear they're the light of the world, the salt of the earth, their ears tickled and how we're all going to overcome and we've got an abundant life in Christ and victory in Jesus. And if you attend here and have for any amount of time, you know I preach every one of those things because they're truth and they're the Bible. But if you've attended here at any length of time, you also know that I will not shy away from tough and hard scriptures in the Bible like that because it's my responsibility as an over-shepherd to preach them too. It's called the full counsel of God's word. And what the apostle Paul is saying here in his own lifetime is that some people were going to come in with a separate agenda other than the agenda of Christ and they were going to be nicknamed wolves and they were going to destroy, not spare the flock. Check this out. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up. Notice these men have self-appointments, not Holy Spirit divine appointments. Woo. It's bad enough we got enemies on the outside, but what Paul went on to say is there will be enemies right inside of you that will appoint themselves and rise up that will eventually destroy you. These men, when they do this, they'll speak perverse things and they will attempt to draw away disciples after themselves. Notice that it didn't say after Jesus, after themselves. In case you didn't know this, it's not my responsibility to make you a follower of me. It's my responsibility. I'm tasked and burdened with helping you become a follower of Jesus. Follow me as I follow him. Now let's look at what the apostle Peter had to say. He said, to the elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and also a witness of the sufferings of Christ, but check this out, I am also a partaker of the glory which shall be revealed. Somebody say, the best is yet to come. 
See, as a born-again Christian, you have experienced salvation. This process you're in in life right now is called sanctification, when you begin to look like God. But, oh, glory, hallelujah, one day I will experience glorification when these wrinkles will fade away, when I'm not tired, when I'm not sleepy, when this body will be turned into a state of perfection. I will know him just as he knows me. That's the glory that Peter said he was also a partaker of that is to come. But now, back on track, verse 2, check this out. Peter said, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. Don't do this by compulsion, but do this willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but do it eagerly. Not as lords over those entrusted to you, but do it as examples to the flock that God has called you to oversee. And when the chief shepherd appears... You will then receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Bow your heads and pray with me this morning. Father Almighty, what a wonderful day it has been here at Rochester Assembly. God, I want to say thank you for the honor that's been given to both myself and the pastoral staff this morning. The honor that now we defer to our deacon board, but ultimately, God, back to you. Such a beautiful process that you've set up. And God, today, I ask that you would help me, your word's already anointed, help me to, to define and explain and to make plain what our roles are and our jobs are as shepherds so that the shepherds under me in this house will understand what I'm expecting of them because you expect it of them. But God, also help me this morning by your anointing so that the flock here is well taken care of and also understands this process you've ordained in the New Testament church as well. Now, if you would just simply say amen like you agree with that, I would really appreciate it. Amen and amen. Today is the day that Rochester Assembly has annually set aside and dedicated to honoring its pastoral staff. Pastor appreciation has a long history here at Rochester Assembly of God and also in the Assemblies of God in general. The reason being for that is this is a biblical concept and one I believe in very much. Now, before you get ahead of me and say, oh, you believe in it very much because you're the pastor and it directly affects and connected to you, just hear me out for a moment. Here's what the Apostle Paul also told his son Timothy in the faith, who was the pastor of the largest church in that world, the church of Ephesus. He said to Timothy, his son in the faith, let the elders who rule with you and among God's flock be counted worthy of double honor. Do you know why the Apostle Paul said men that serve in the role as shepherds and overseers, elders in the church are worthy of double honor? It's because in the book of James, the Bible says they're going to receive double the judgment. The double the judgment overseers will receive is they will first give an account for themselves and then they will give an account of how they served you. With the responsibility also comes the authority. With the responsibility also comes the honor. Of course, with me being the lead pastor here on staff, this is directly connected to me and affects me. So first, please allow me to begin by saying this morning, thank you, sincerely. The most uncomfortable that I have been in this entire morning is when a very beloved friend of mine and deacon, Mr. Key Talley, calls my name. It was a little bit easier when my family was with me. They weren't with me in the first one. But when he calls my name and I stand up and all you wonderful people smile at me and clap your hands and give me a little wink and say, Pastor, we appreciate That is so uncomfortable for me. I'm like ready to transition. I'm ready to like get to worship, preach the word, love on you, help you with things. And you're like, I'm like squirming like a little worm on a hook. Like, oh, I'm just... I mean, I get it, and we need to do it, but I'm uncomfortable. I'm honored, and I'm blessed to serve at Rochester Assembly in the role of lead pastor. I love you all very much, and whether you know it or not, I just want to be transparent with you for a moment. My family and I have made many hard decisions and many personal sacrifices to answer the call of God in obedience to be here with you and to be with this church in this season to lead it into what is next. I love what God is doing 
in and with Rochester Assembly. It's not something I begrudge or regret. Honestly, just to be truthful, this is the greatest and the most rewarding season of ministry I have ever experienced in my life. And that's not lip service, it's the truth. This morning, I wish I could begin to tell you about the unity on our board. I wish I could begin to tell you about our staff's willingness to embrace while honoring what has been. They're also pursuit of, oh, pastor, what's in your heart? The vision from God. What do you have for our future? I wish I could tell you about the extenuating things that are happening in missions and what is about to come in the next few weeks where we believe we're going to be able to reach the world in a new and a profound way like we've never done before. I wish I could tell you about all the renovations. I wish I could tell you about the financial stability. I wish I could tell you about more life groups. We get in trouble for having too many people in life groups when most churches don't have anybody for life groups. I wish I could tell you about the youth back there getting born again and seeing miracles in their lives. I wish I could tell you about the young adults who were posting up at coffee shops, winning young people to the Lord at 20 years old. I wish I could tell you about Reed and the kids ministry and the impact it's having on little kids' lives like my own where mom and I are in the kitchen having a conversation and my kid calls me down and says, Dad, I learned something different. You're doing that wrong. Pastor Reed taught me in kids ministry this is what the bible says this is a great church and there are a lot of wonderful things happen when i begin to think about this day pastor appreciation months ago those of you that are connected here you know we prepare weeks in advance when i begin to think about the awkwardness of me myself filling the pulpit on this day i i, I went through several different ideas and i eventually landed on a simple concept I wanted to have church this morning. I didn't want to have some pageantry or some dog and pony show. Yes, I did want to continue to build on and reinforce the culture of honoring pastoral leadership here at Rochester Assembly. But I also looked at this as an opportunity to get into the Word of God and to explain the biblical significance of what shepherds really do. When I began to think about this mix of what all needed to happen today, I soon realized that this was not something I needed to farm out or put off on someone else. I realized this was something that I needed to do as the leader. This is not about me. This is about leading our church through this season in this matter. And it's my hope this morning that as I take some time and slow down and talk about pastoral appreciation, I pray that God would use me to help this concept be better understood by each of us in this room today. That includes both the pastors in this room, the shepherds, and the people of God, the flock of God, which the shepherds are called and appointed to care for. Now, you may not know this, but the pastoral staff here works. Like, their families were standing up here with them, and if you know any of their families, their families will tell you that, you know, there are seasons, days, and hours where sometimes they don't see their mom and dad an awful lot because we don't just show up for church on Wednesday. We don't just show up for church on Monday. This staff actually works. Why I have never been a proponent of using the staff to save the world and let them lose their own families, I have always believed that we should work, we should plan, we should organize, we should strategize, and we should be faithful in what we're doing for God. But amidst that working, I've always believed that our church should be in church, that our pastoral staff should attend every week. They should hear the message. And so what I want you to know today is half of this message will be for the pastoral staff. And out of these three morning experiences, they have either already heard it or they are hearing it right now because much of what God downloaded to me applies to me and it applies to them. The other half of what I'm sharing that God downloaded to me is for you, God's people, the flock. And I am excited to share what he's laid on my heart this morning. So to jump into this concept of shepherding straight from the Bible, the very first thing that needs to be said and needs to be understood to help us all understand this, this relationship of the flock that God set up in the Bible is this, is shepherds lay down their lives for sheep. Shepherds lay down their lives for sheep. Years ago, I'm going to tell a short story here before I start preaching the scripture. When I was serving with my previous lead pastor as the co-pastor of a church, I would preach on Wednesdays. He would come in. He would say to me, John, what do you need? Is there anything I can do for you? 
And then on Sundays, I would return the favor. I would step into his office, open the door, and I'd say, Pastor Shane, is there anything I could do for you? And this morning, you didn't give me an instruction. He said, come in, John, close the door. I want to show you something. And he said, but before I show you this, I want to ask you a question. He said, do you believe God would tell a lie to fulfill his plan and his will? I said, oh, absolutely not, Pastor. God would never. He said, okay, well, let me ask this way. Do you think God would instruct a prophet to tell a lie, to fulfill his plan and his will in the earth? I said, oh, no, Pastor. I absolutely disagree with that. He said, well, can you explain this scripture to me then? And the scripture was this. King Saul had been rebuked by God and told that he would lose the kingdom. He then, God, then told Samuel, the last judge and the first prophet, to go anoint a son of Jesse that he would show him as the new king of Israel. Could you imagine being Samuel that day? Like, like, I've got to go. You're still king, but i got to go tell the new guy he's going to be king. And Samuel, being very afraid of the then king Saul, he said to God, God! What is going to happen when King Saul finds out? What do I tell him? And God said, you just tell Saul you're going to prepare a sacrifice. Did God lie? And in the natural, that may appear to be a lie. In the natural, that may not have been what Samuel was actually going to do. But if you look at that in the spirit realm, in the supernatural, it is exactly what was happening. It is exactly what Samuel was going to do. In order for David to be the king of the nation, he would be asked of God to make the greatest sacrifice of his life. Oh, we see president. Oh, we see congressman. Oh, we see senator. Oh, we see king of the nation. And we see 12 tribes. We see promised land. We see wealth. We see buildings. We see temple. We see all of the limelight and the fanfare. But what we don't see about leadership is the sacrifice that every leader has to make. And the sacrifice is this, that even though leaders have their own agendas, even though leaders have their own desires and they want their own way, they are called of God and bound to live sacrificially to put the needs of others before them. What we don't see in David's story is the burden of always caring for the 12 tribes, of always fighting the battles God called them to fight, winning the wars, taking the land, and growing growing the territory that God called his children to make. It was indeed a sacrifice that day. It wasn't a lie. It was a sacrifice. Because David, even though he was about to be catapulted to king, was about to be asked to make the greatest sacrifice he had ever made. And that was to no longer live for himself, but to live for other people that God would make him shepherd and overseer of. Let me show that to you in the scriptures. 1 Samuel chapter 17 Verses 12 through 38 tell, or 12 through 37, tell a very interesting story, a different story than I'm quoting to you now, but it's going to bring out the point that I'm making beautifully. Would you begin reading with me 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28? Here's what it says. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, his being David's older brother, when he heard, he being David, speaking to the men, what men? The armies of Israel. Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? Can I tell you where here was? It was the valley of Elam. It's where the children of Israel's army were drew up in battle lines against the Philistines giant of Gath named Goliath of Gath. Eliab said, why did you come down here? With whom have you left those few sheep? And with whom have you left that little flock of our fathers out in the wilderness? Eliab said, I know your pride, David. I know the insolence of your heart. For you've left and abandoned, neglected our father's flock. And you came down here just to watch this fight. David said, what have I done now, Eliab? Is there not a cause? Then David turned to the other men who were around him and said the same thing. What have I done? Why are y'all mad at me? Is there not a cause? And these people answered him as the first one did. You know what they said? You're prideful. You're insolent. You abandoned your father's flock out in the desert. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. 
And he sent for him, he being King Saul, sent for David. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail him today because of Goliath of Gath, the giant. Your servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. And Saul then said to David, You're not able to go out and fight against this Philistine giant and to fight with him. You're only a little boy. You're just a youth. What in the world can you do? And this great giant has been a man of war since he was a little boy, since his youth. Now pay real careful attention. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear would come and take one of my father's lambs out of the flock, I would go after it. I would strike it to deliver the lamb from the lion's mouth or from the bear's mouth. And then when that lion and that bear would rise up against me, I would catch them by their beard and I would strike it in the head till I killed it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears out here protecting his daddy's flock. Check this out. And David rises up in faith and says, This uncircumcised Philistine will be no different than they were. He will die just like them, seeing that he has defiled the flock, the armies of the living God. Listen to this, 37. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and delivered me from the paw of the bear, he will also deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. I don't know if two plus two is making four for you yet. The point that I'm belaboring here is shepherds have always been called to make sacrifices and lay down their lives for their flocks and for their sheep. And here we can see these things happening in David's life. Two points that I want to point out. David drew the confidence that he needed that day to go out and to face this giant from his past experiences of watching over his daddy's little flock out there in the middle of the wilderness. Second thing I want you to see in his shepherding both of his father's flock, Jesse's flock, and now his heavenly father, Jehovah flock, the children of Israel out there in the valley of Elam about to fight Goliath of Gath, the Philistine. David knew that what he was called to do in both instances as a shepherd and an overseer was to go out and to face the enemy. It may be a wolf. It may be a lion. It may be a bear. It may be a giant. Oh, pay close attention right now. It may be addiction. It may be drunkenness. It may be physical abuse, domestic abuse. It may be financial problems. It may be something going on in your life but what shepherds have always been called to do is to put their lives in harm's way as they watch over the flock of God David said I'm not afraid I've stood against the lion I've stood against the bear and I won as I stood up for God's people he said I'm not scared of Goliath the Philistine of Gath no more than I am scared of Satan when he comes knocking on your door trying to destroy your marriage when he comes knocking on your door trying to destroy your children, but what shepherds have always been called to do is to not live for themselves, but to lay down their lives for the flocks that they care for. And how I do that is standing up when this world in which we live comes in like wolves and says same-sex marriage is okay. Stopping at the casino and spending your paycheck instead of bringing home the bacon to mama starts occurring in your life. Teaching you on November the 3rd, I don't care who you vote for as long as you vote the Bible. You vote what the Bible says. You find a platform that lines up with the Word of God. You stand for truth. You stand for what the Word of God. And a shepherd is willing to put himself in harm's way. When you get mad at him, when the drug dealer gets mad at him, when the person that your husband's having an affair gets mad at him, the shepherd always stands out there and says, I'm willing to put myself in harm's way between you and the wolves in this world because they come in trying to destroy the flock. And I'm not afraid of you. The very first time King Jesus ever spoke and preached a message about shepherds, this is what he said, very first words. He said, I am the good shepherd. Can I, can I tell you something? I'm not the good shepherd. I am the under shepherd, under the good shepherd. And all of the pastoral staff that shepherds here are the under shepherds under me, and we're all under the chief shepherd, the eternal shepherd, the good shepherd of heaven. And each of our staff should be emulating the good shepherd. And here's what the good shepherd does. 
He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. When David was anointed king, it was a sacrifice because those in leadership sacrifice to serve those they protect. When David went out to protect his father's little flock, he laid his life on the line. When David went out to fight Goliath, he went out to protect the flock and put his life on the line in harm's way against the giants of that day. And sometimes that shows up in church like this with me or our staff as shepherds. Ring, ring. How's it going today, bud? Oh, it's going okay. Not not the best day. Well, yeah, hey, man, I heard through the grapevine. Actually, I talked to your wife. She told me what was going on. And, uh, man, I, I just wanted to tell you, uh, I'm going to love you through this. I, uh, I want you to know that, that you're welcome at church. I want you to know that as your pastor, we're, we're open to helping you, maybe get in some long-term counseling, uh, you know, getting you into some discipleship. I can't tell you having an affair with the secretary and your wife was the right thing. Honestly, I have to tell you it was the wrong thing. It was very selfish. It was immature. But I want you to know as the shepherd, I'm willing to put myself in harm's way both with you and this issue to tell you right from wrong. But I want you to know that I love you and I will help you as your pastor through this addiction, through this pornography issue, through this affair, through this abuse. That's what being a shepherd looks like. Number one, shepherds lay down their lives for the flocks. Can I be honest with you? Sometimes we don't like making those phone calls. Sometimes it would be easier not to go to work on those days. You ever heard the old joke? Get up, Johnny. You got to go to church today. Mom, I'm not going to church. Johnny, get up. You got to go to church today. Mom, those people don't like me. Johnny, you got to get up. You got to go to church today. Mom, I'm not going to church. Johnny, you got to go to church. You're the pastor. <laughs> Sometimes in shepherding, we see things in the flock's lives that we recognize as lions, bears, giants, and wolves that are meant to destroy your homes, your marriages, your family, your children, your future, and your finances. And not in a spirit of condemnation, not in a spirit of judgment, but in a spirit of humility, but also in divine authority. We are called to step into those situations, lay our lives down even when we don't want to go. And protect you against the wolves that are feeding on the flesh of your life today. Shepherds lay down their lives. Now, I'm not only informing you what shepherds do, I'm telling each of our staff what they are called and charged of God to do in the Bible. Next thing that I need to tell you about shepherds is this. Shepherds are totally different than hirelings. Shepherds are totally different than hirelings. Jesus went on to say in the first sermon he preached about shepherds. He said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who is not called to or appointed and does not own the sheep, he sees the wolves coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf comes into the flock and catches the sheep and scatters them and devours them and the hireling flees because he's just a hireling. He does not really care about the flock. Now I want to tell you something. That's totally counterculture to what we do today. Here's how that goes down today. Ring, 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 ring. Hey, what's up, Pratcher John? What's up, Preacher John? Hey, man, just call and want to touch base with you. Man, would you like to go get a glass of coffee? Yeah, sure, Pastor. I'll meet you for coffee. All right, I'll tell you what. See me, see me at, at the coffee shop at 2 p.m. Hey, bro, I, man, that's tough for me to do this. I'm not meddling, not being nosy. I just, you know, caught wind of something, and I know there's some issues. And, uh, you know, man, I, I just want to talk to you as your pastor. You know, I don't think that's healthy. Who do you think you are? Why are you meddling in my business? Don't be calling me. Who you think? You ain't perfect. What you got going? Who you think you are getting in my business? I ain't never going back to your church. You self-righteous, legalistic. Woo! That's what happens in the world today. But that's not 
what the Bible says should happen. The Bible says that when the true shepherd sees the wolf coming and destroying, the shepherd steps in because he's a shepherd. He has a divine appointment. He's called to the flock. And he says, in love and in humility, but with divine authority, I'm trying to protect your marriage. I'm trying to protect your kids. I'm trying to safeguard your life. The hireling, on the other hand, which we've all gotten used to in church, that turns a blind eye to the abuse, that turns a blind eye to the addiction, that turns a blind eye to the pornography. The Bible says that he doesn't do it because he loves you. He does it because he's getting a pocket full of a paycheck to line his pocket with and he could care less if your life falls apart and you go to hell in a handbasket. But that is not what shepherds are called to do. That's what hirelings do. Shepherds give their lives for the flock because they're appointed, not paid. Shepherds give their lives for the flock because their assignment to a flock is from a higher authority. Shepherds give their lives for a flock and they express that sacrifice laying their lives on the line in many ways. Text, phone calls, discipleship, counseling appointments, follow-ups, coffee dates, and on and on and on. Helping people grow into what Christ has called them to be. Hirelings, on the other hand, they just flee when trouble comes. Stuff hits your life and they say, I'm going to stay out of that. That's messy. I got, a pro I got a promise for you. Discipleship is messy. There ain't one of you in this room that got born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and got it all together the next day, including me. It's a process of growing in godliness. And pastors, shepherds are called to walk with people through those messy processes. Hirelings flee when trouble comes because they don't have a divine appointment. They don't have a divine call. They don't own the sheep. They don't care if your lives get twisted up, torn up, and pulled apart. I'm both very encouraged by the words coming out of my mouth, but listen to me, I'm also very convicted by the words coming out of my mouth. I desire, as the lead pastor of this church, to be a pastor and to lead a pastoral staff that is of the former, not the latter. I want to be a pastor. I can't be in every place. I can't solve every issue. But I want to be a pastor when confronted with issues that works hard to shepherd your soul for eternity to come. I want the pastors that serve under me as under shepherds to be genuine pastors who care about your children, care about your marriages, care about your families, and care about your futures. And sometimes that means we make sacrifices that honestly most people wouldn't make to love you through the messes of your life. Today when this church asks you to honor pastors, that's what you're honoring. That when nobody else would come to the rehab, when the court system said, lock them up and throw them away the key. When your wife said, I'm never going back, the pastor showed up and took you to coffee and tried to work with you, tried to help you. Third thing, Pastor Chad, would you come? I want to land this plane. Third thing that needs to be said today is from the greatest, most memorable psalm in all of the New Testament. We learn that the good shepherd carries two instruments in his hand. Can I quote it for you? Yea, though, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, period. No, that's what most of us think it says, because that's what we like. I ain't afraid of nothing! Because the Lord is with me. That's not what the verse says. The verse says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Number one, because you're with me. And because you're with me, I understand you carry two instruments in your hand. Your rod and your staff are with me. Can I tell you about a rod? I grew up on a farm. I can tell you what those are. I've also been to the Middle East several times. I can also tell you from Middle Eastern customs and manners what those instruments are. You want to hear about them? Let me give you a little lesson from the flock right quick. All right? In every flock, there are shepherds and there are hirelings. In every flock, there are sheep and there are goats. In every flock, there are wolves and lions and bears. 
Shepherds carry rods in their hands. You know what rods are? They're about two foot, three foot long. They're not large in diameter. They're actually very flimsy. And they're short. Very short. Not very big. You want to know what they are? They're rods of correction. They're, they're not big. They're not heavy. They're not made for beating. They're made for guiding. Sheep start, you know, sheep are mostly. Bad. A sheep will go stand out there in the middle of Interstate 52 and get run over by a cement trunk. Boom! Marriage will get blown apart in a thousand pieces. Bad. You ever heard this? He anoints my head with oil. You ever heard that in that same song? You don't know what that is? Because the wool, just give me, and I, I didn't give all this in the other ones. The wool, as it grows, gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And flies start to lay larvae in that, and they build infection sites, and they'll penetrate down into the ears and the eyes, and they'll kill the lambs. It's like the enemy laying negative thoughts in your head. But the shepherd anoints my head with oil. So that stuff, those, those thoughts, the larvae, the flies, they never get to build those nests. He anoints my head with oil because you're sticking your head through a fence post trying to get something to eat and you get stuck in something you didn't mean to get into. Now you got a little slick head. Shoo, just pop right out. He's got this little rod that he carries with him. And when you go, eh, out here in 52, he doesn't do this. Bang, bang, bang. It's not made for it. He just taps you on your neck. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can't be in the club. Hold on. Whoa. No, Jesus ain't with all that. Jesus may have found you in the club, but Jesus won't leave you in the club, player. Oh, whoa. It's a rod of correction. Got to get you back over here. I'm going to do it with humility. I'm going to do it with love. Do it with some humor. I'm going to do it graciously. I'm not nobody special. It's just what I feel divinely called to do. Matter of fact, I'm one bad decision for man being in the club with you too, man. Reason I'm going to be gracious because I came out of that. So I'm going to be gracious to you to get you out of that. Rod of correction. A little bit short thing. It's for the neck and for the back. You know why it's short? Because shepherds spend time with their sheep. This isn't a long instrument for people way far away. It's a little bitty instrument because shepherds smell like sheep. You show me somebody that says he's called to be a shepherd and he doesn't like people. Now, not one pastor on staff can be with all y'all. This is a large church, right? And we'll do our best. I had a staff member say, Pastor, I'm struggling so bad because I'm afraid you're going to get on to me if I don't get to it all. I said, wait a minute. I don't expect you to get to it all. I'm never going to get on to you because you couldn't get to it all. Matter of fact, don't save the world and lose your family. Go on, take care of your family. Rest. Take your vacation. Only time I'm ever going to get on to you if I don't see you trying, if I see you neglecting. But you can't do it all in one day. I'm a list guy. I can't do it all in one day. You show me somebody that's a pastor and they never want to be around people, never want to be around sheep. They just want to come here, do church, and run and hide. Something's wrong. Shepherds carry a little bitty rod. It's a rod. It's a flimsy little rod. It's for the neck and for the back. It's a rod of correction. It's short because he's right there with his sheep. And he just lovingly guides them in the way that they're supposed to go. That's what shepherds do. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that correction from the Lord means you're his son. You know, we've gotten, we're in a world today. I don't know who you think you are to correct me. Nobody wants to be corrected. Can I tell you what the Bible says? The Bible says, hold yourself accountable, and then your pastor will never have to hold you accountable. Trust me, I would rather you do it. Because you get mad at me when I do it. That's why I try so hard to do it in the right way. The Bible says the Lord corrects those whom he loves. It says, but if you don't receive that correction, chastening from the Lord, that's when you should be afraid. Because it says you're no longer his son. The Bible uses a real strong B word for that. It says you've slipped over into being a bastard without a father. But a father corrects his sons and daughter because he loves them. Like the Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Uh, oh, oh. Boy, you took me to coffee and slapped the taste out of my mouth because you heard I was smoking weed trying to say, God, put this here. 
It's an herb. Took me to coffee. Oh, you knocked the taste out of my mouth. Hold on. Yeah, God did put this here. Penicillin's here too. I don't see you taking that. Cyanide's here. God didn't tell you to dry it up, hang it upside down, wrap it in a tree bag, shake it, roll it up in a 1.5 choke, stick it in a bomb, light it with a blowtorch, and suck it through water, though. God put this here. God put a lot of other things here, too, play. I don't see you on them. I don't go to church full of hypocrites. Hypocrites at the gas station. I saw you getting gas. Bible says deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. This is what it Oh yeah, girl, we going out. We going to the club. We stay up all night. Boom, get his number. I'm trying to make you feel good. Life's going to hell in a handbasket. Been not taking care of your son from your first marriage. Not taking care. That's not that's not good. That's not true. It's okay, girl. No, it's not okay. You're going to look up one day and your son's going to be 40 and you don't even have a relationship with him because you ran around staying all night out with men when he was three years old and left him with anybody that'd keep him. Is this a little too real for you? shepherd also carries a staff. Did y'all see that big staff Dick Noel made me the day Pastor Jim Philbeck and I did the passing? The man was like eight foot tall. It's like a true replica of a shepherd's staff. Like eight foot tall. That sucker was as big around as a tree trunk. Listen to me. You get hit by that thing, brother, you night night. It's lights out. You're going to think you got hit by Mike Tyson. You get whopped with that thing. It's a long instrument, and it's a heavy instrument. You don't know what it is? It's a staff the shepherd also carries. David said, I take comfort when I walk through the valleys of shadow of death because you're with me, and as I'm walking through this evil and this perverse world, I know you've got a rod of correction. You love me. You're my daddy. You're my good shepherd. You'll guide me. You'll lay it on my neck. It's not going to hurt me. It's only going to make me better. You'll walk me through this thing, God, because you love me, but I also know when the wolves come, when the giants of addiction come, when the lions of racism come, when the giants come of pornography, I know my shepherd's got an eight foot long arsonistic weapon that he will take and poke the lions, poke the bears. You get away from the flock. You can't have their marriages. You can't have their children. You can't have their finances. You can't have their future. And if the wolf messes up and get close enough, he will pie out him right between the eye. Kill that thing. Get it off your life. David said, I know you got it. And then he'll flip that thing around like he's from the Matrix. Don't look at me so holy. You know you watched it. He'll reach out there and grab you with that shepherd's hook woo, and pull you right back in church, right back in women's ministry, right back in men's ministry, right back to Minnesota Men's United this weekend, right back in life group. Rod and your staff, they comfort. You want to know what that staff's for? That staff is for protection, to keep the enemies off your life, to whop those wolves in the head, those lions in the head, get them off your life and pull you back into what God has for you in your life. Three things shepherds do. They lay down their lives for the flock that God calls them to serve. They're different than hirelings because they don't run when the enemy comes. And number three, they carry rods of correction for your neck. And they carry staffs of protection for the enemy's head to crush him and get him out of your life. <clears throat> Honestly, there's so much more that I could share today. Let me just tell you a few things. The Bible says, shepherds tend and care for sheep. They feed sheep, they strengthen the weak, they bind up the broken, they heal the sick, they go and search for the lost. Like, yeah, hey, I'm glad everything's going good here, that we're remodeling, I'm glad everything's looking pretty and we got life groups and we got kids ministry, but let me tell you something, there's something inside of my heart that says there's a man coming out of overcomers, there's a young lady coming out of Teen Challenge, she don't know the Lord, the Lord tells me, he puts it in my heart, there's somebody on a bar stool, there's somebody at a tattoo parlor, there's somebody 
somebody still in a crack house. There's somebody still out there sitting in a Mayo executive suite office that doesn't know Jesus. They're dying and they're on their way to hell. And the shepherd's heart in me says, I'm happy about the 99, but I got to go after the one that's still lost. That's what shepherds do. Not just me, that's what our shepherds do. Ready for this? Shepherds can tell the difference of sheep and goats. You want to know what sheep say? Sheep say, yeah. You want to know what goats say? No. I'll let you decide. Are you a sheep or a goat? Can I tell you what sheep do? Sheep lay down and let the shepherd shear it. They lay down and let him cut the things off their life that need to be cut off. You know what goats do? They always, nah, button into things, running their heads up into stuff they ain't got no business button into. There's wolves in the flock. You know what wolves are? I can show you how to identify them. They're always feeding on the latest flesh, the latest blood, the latest gossip. Did you hear what he did? Did you hear what she did? Did you hear how that? I can tell you among every flock there are bears, there are lions, things that are coming in sometimes from without, sometimes from from within trying to pull the whole thing apart it's called lessons from the flock shepherds hireling sheep goat wolves lions and bears it's all a part of this thing and today I get the responsibility of talking about the shepherd today I've shared with you what they're supposed to do and I'm challenging myself and our staff to do those things in light of the sacrifice that they make, we make, I'm asking you to honor them for the service they provide for your soul, your children's soul, and your grandchildren's soul. I got news for you. Menards isn't doing the church's work. I got news for you. I love Channel One. We give to them for the food distribution, but Channel One's not doing the church's work. I love New Life Family Services. We support them, but Channel One, New Life Family Services, isn't preaching the gospel. There's only one. Target isn't doing the church's work. Apache Mall isn't doing. Shields isn't doing the church's work. The church is the only institution, organization that God placed in the earth to do this work. And today, I'm just trying to tell you what the shepherds are supposed to be doing. This morning, I'm done. we got to land this plane. I've gone a little bit long. My hope in sharing this information has just been twofold. I want our pastors to know what God instructs and charges them to do. And number two, I wanted you as the flock, the people of God, to understand their roles in hopes that you would be willing to honor those men and women. Not me, honor them. I wish somebody else said, let me come preach this at their church because I could preach it even better if it didn't directly apply to me. I'm not saying this for a pat on the back. I'm saying it because it's the truth of God's word. It's what we're supposed to do. Amen or oh me. Stand up on your feet this morning. I got to land this plane. Bow your heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, most loving, gracious, heavenly Father, thank you for this great church. Thank you for pastor appreciation. Thank you for a wonderful group of people that will love and honor and accept their pastor's love, direction, and correction. Father, today I lift up these pastors. I pray that they would have heard the word of God, the charge, and that they would commit as I'm committing to loving and serving in like fashion. Father, I pray a hedge of protection around their marriages. I pray rest to their bodies, their minds. I pray that they would be fresh and they would be passionately anointed by your spirit for the work of the ministries and that each of their departments would grow. Now, God, I lift up this flock to you. You said among this flock, ravages wolves would come in trying to destroy the flock and pulling men away and women away to themselves. Father, I pray against that today. I pray for this flock to be protected from the wrong and the destruction the world offers us up on every turn. I pray that this church today would hold true to the Bible, that this church would believe your word, that this church would be dedicated to studying your word, that they would be dedicated to the moving of the Holy Spirit, dedicated to revival, and also dedicated to reaching the world through missions, beginning in our Jerusalem, then to our Judea, and then to the utmost parts of the world. God, I ask that you would accomplish all this in Jesus' mighty name. And let the church say, amen and amen.